This week marks the 10th anniversary of the start of the Iraq War. 179 British servicemen and women died during the conflict, and it's thought that at least 116,000 civilians lost their lives in the years following the invasion. Over the next two days, we'll be live in Iraq to find out what life is now like and providing analysis about Britain's involvement in the war and the legacy of the invasion. But uh, first, let's have a look uh, in more detail at the human cost of the war. Civilian casualty figures for the Iraq conflict are heavily disputed. A conservative estimate suggests around 100,000 Iraqis have died in violence since 2003. But the figure could be as high as 650,000. That's according to a study by The Lancet. What's not disputed is that 179 British troops lost their lives in Iraq while 426 were wounded. Our correspondent, Ben Brown, reports now from Baghdad. Ten years ago, it began with the bombing of Baghdad. Shock and awe, they called it. And then the American and British troops poured across the border. I was one of the reporters travelling with them. When Saddam Hussein's statue in Baghdad was toppled soon afterwards, Mohammed al Saidi was among the jubilant crowd. Then he was expectant. Today he's disillusioned. We had high hopes that change would give the Iraqi people freedom and prosperity, but the steps taken since then have been very slow. Parts of Iraq are still troubled by violence. A car bomb only yesterday near Basra killed 10 people. And there are worries about the economy too. These are just a few of Iraq's army of unemployed. They stand on street corners hoping someone will offer them a job. Is it not better now than it was under Saddam for these people? It's worse now, this man told me. Under Saddam, we could eat and prices were cheap. Nowadays, things are so expensive, we can't feed our families. This car, BMW. And yet Iraq is enjoying record economic growth. At this car showroom, the manager told me that sales have never been better. And the optimists here say, despite all its problems, Iraq is now a free country. I think it's better now. You can say whatever you want, you want to say. You can write whatever we want to write on Facebook and social media and newspapers, even on television. But the truth is that 10 years on, Iraq is still not a nation at peace with itself. Ben Brown reporting. Well, the human rights lawyer Phil Shiner has represented a number of Iraqi civilians who claim they were systematically abused by British soldiers during the Iraq war, and he's in Birmingham for us now. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. You said that Iraq effectively has taken over your life for the last 10 years, in fact, even more than 10 years, because you were involved in the campaign to try to stop the war happening in the first place. So, so just take us back to that time, if you would. Well, we brought a case in the High Court for Judicial Review on behalf of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, history now shows us that we got the law, international law, completely right. Um, but the court said, well, there's a keep out sign, it's a defence policy, policy, and they wouldn't look at it. Unfortunately, as we all know now, there wasn't a shred of legality to the invasion. And if, we'd, if the court had adjudicated back in December 2002, then I am convinced that the UK at least wouldn't have been part of the coalition. So looking back on that, it must seem really like quite a bitter experience, I suppose, one with a lot of regrets for you. Well, I suspected um, in that era that what was going to happen was that the way in which we used force, um, the use of cluster um, bombs, indiscriminate attacks on civilians were going to lead to war crimes being committed or allegedly committed by the UK and that's turned out to be true. But even more than that, um, it now turns out, well through my clients, there are hundreds of my clients making allegations 
uh, thousands of allegations of torture and ill treatment and abuse. And we all know the case of Baha Musa, who was uh, killed in custody. Well, yes, uh, I wanted to ask you about that case because obviously that was the one where you came to prominence and, and uh, a report found that he had suffered, and I'll quote from the report, uh, an appalling episode of serious, gratuitous violence and a very serious uh, breach of discipline by British soldiers. Yes. Well, unfortunately, there were so many more Bahamusas. By the um, 20th of May, 2003, we'd only been there a few, a few weeks. Um, Nicholas Mercer, who was the head of Army Legal, was warning that a number of Iraqi civilians had been killed in custody with various units. There were at least eight by that stage. Um, and many of my clients are complaining that their men were taken into custody alive and were returned dead. And uh, we've got a, a hearing in a case about all of this this Friday. And it's fair to say that the Court of Appeal judge and the High Court judge are very concerned that years have gone by and no one has looked into these cases. It's not just Baha Musa. There and, are uh, so many other cases. And I'm sure you would agree that on all sides there has been a lack of justice for some. We heard, for example, from Reg Keyes earlier, whose son was killed by a mob in Iraq. He has never had justice for the death of his son. I mean, looking back now on this 10-year anniversary, what would you say that, that the most important lessons are that have been learned from this whole experience? Can I just say before I do that my firm acts for um, the, the six soldiers in that incident and we're trying to get an inquiry into what went wrong in June 2003 on behalf of Reg and, and the other five um, grieving f family. Um, I think the main thing that went wrong was there was this illegal rush to war and we now see that there was virtually no attempt to plan for the occupation at all. So again going back to what Nicholas Mercer said, he was concerned in March 2003 that there was apparently no detention policy and he was concerned that we were going to fail to meet our international obligations in respect of the way in which we were detaining and interning Iraqis and how correct and fortunate that turned out to be. Um, there was this collusion between the UK and the US. They thought they could manipulate the Security Council and change international law by their dominance of the Security Council so that they could rewrite the Iraqi constitution to allow them to do the things that they wanted to do. Um, at the same time, they were turning a blind eye to the looting of the cultural heritage of the cradle of civilization, uh, Babylon. Um, okay. I mean, the whole thing has just been a disaster. And from where I sit, um, we have pretty much destroyed whole sections of the Iraqi infrastructure. Phil Shiner, um, human rights lawyer, thank you very much.